Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another Reverts Reality episode number 22, mashallah. My name is Nahila Morales and I am here with my co-host, Sister Arenda Dhaka. Sister Arenda? Hi there, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have an amazing uh, topic for today. And I'm sure our title has made you wonder. One, two, three, four. We have some great guests with us today on our panel. Uh, um Leon Zainab was born and raised Muslim in Brooklyn, New York. She attended the Islamic school from elementary through high school. She studied education and school psychology. And after teaching at both Islamic and public schools, uh, for several years, she found the Teenage Muslimat Inc. founded, found the Teenage Muslimat Inc. in 2011 due to the challenges that she faced in her own journey growing up as a Muslim and concerns for the struggles facing indigenous Muslim youth. Uh, after she moved to Saudi Arabia in 2015, Zainab returned to the state and in 2019, she co-founded Muslim Wholehearted Initiative an initiative close to her heart that serves as a means of supporting Muslims in reconnecting to their purpose, worshiping Allah whole, wholeheartedly. Zainab currently works as a mental health counselor, a recovery specialist, and she resides with her family and six-year-old daughter in Brooklyn, New York. Our other panelist today is Noor Sadeh. She's one of our neighbors here in the Dallas area. She's the owner of Noor Art, one of the largest Islamic media online platforms in North America. She's been active in the Dallas community as a public speaker since 2004. Nur is the Muslim co-lead for the Dallas chapter of Daughters of Abraham, as well as a member of the Steering Committee for Friends for Good, an interfaith group working with Jewish evangelical Christian, Muslim, and Unitarian congregations. Nur is a regular contributor for a number of publications, Plaid for Women, Family Flavors, and recently Islamic Horizons, and the soon-to-be-launched American Muslim Today online publication. She is a passionate advocate and activist for the rights of women. And thank you, ladies, so much for joining us today on this amazing topic that I will pass back to Sister Nahila to introduce for us today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanallahi wa bihamdi wa shadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah. So... Topics like this keep me up at night, and I had a rough time sleeping last night. Um, but alhamdulillah, I had a very, um, very good conversation with one of our scholars, um, Imam Lebron. And so um, I want to start, I like to start always with um, an ayah from Lebron. Um, in particular, this, this, this topic that we're speaking about today is uh, polygyny. And so um, it's a big, big, big topic, very broad topic. I don't know how much justice we will do in one hour, but we hope that we enlighten uh, um, and bring a lot of uh, goodness to this topic, understanding and education. Um, you know, something that um, before I read the ayah, something uh, as a new convert myself, I remember when I first heard it um, coming into Islam, it was almost like a bad, bad word, you know, and it was like, oh, my God, no, no, I would never do that. I would never accept that. I would never, never, never. And so now that I look back, it was my ignorance. I had no knowledge, no understanding, no education. And so obviously um, with time, I have been very blessed to uh, learn more about it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran and the interpretation of the meanings, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In Surah An-Nisa, um, uh, uh, chapter number four of the woman, in Ayah, the verse is uh, three, and he tells us, if you fear, you might fail to give orphan women their due rights. If you were to marry them, then marry other women of your choice, two, three, or four. But if you are afraid, you will fail to maintain just, then contain yourselves to just one. Um, so I think that's, that's very, very important right there. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna start um, the conversation because I think uh, our panelists have a lot to say and a lot to um, bring to the conversation, inshallah. 
first and foremost, let's understand polygyny, right? And obviously, I don't know if you could hear it in my voice, but I am pro. And I believe there's a lot of benefit. I believe there's a lot of goodness. And obviously, because it was ordained by our creator, we, who are we to look down upon it, right? On the contrary, um, if you don't know, I mean, if it's not good for you, it doesn't mean that it's not good for other families. So let me start with um, uh, Sister Noor. Um, as far as um, the understanding or, or you know, wh where are you with this, um, this order from Allah? How do you feel about this? Assalamu alaikum, both Nihil and Arinda. Thank you again. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi Bashlaj al-Sabri wa yafir al-Umri wa akla uqa ditan al-Lisani yafqahu kawli. Um, we always hope that Allah will guide our tongues to say something that's understood and, and we say the right things. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in his book of guidance uh, rulings that are for all times, all places, all peoples, all societies. It is not a hard and fast rule for every single person every man must marry for. There are situations where it is called for. And of course, there's lots of examples of that. But, you know, we do have a lot of sisters that say, I can't, I won't, I will never. And of course, the United States right now, I believe it's currently illegal to do such things. But Allah in his wisdom always reveals things that are relevant for any time and place. And one of the references I make to my American audiences when they're so aghast, because this is a very contentious subject. Among Muslims, and certainly among the non-Muslims, it's one of the first questions they always throw at women. What about polygamy, polygamy, polygyny, so forth. And I always say to them, because I reference to a story, a popular story, Jane Eyre, where it's a long story, it's a fair, fairly a common story, we had to read it in high school and so forth. But the, in the end of it, the man of the, the Lord of the Manor has a wife who he's been hiding away who has mental issues. And he falls in love with a young governess who comes to work in their house and she has no knowledge of the woman in the attic. And of course, in those days, he couldn't very well keep the woman in the attic as his wife and marry Jane, that was illegal. So he has to let go of Jane or Jane finds out that he's married and so forth. And there's a mess anyway, the house burns down, the crazy lady burns down the house and there's a lot of problems. And I said, if, if Rochester, the Lord of the Manor had only been able to marry Jane and keep his wife and take care of her and maintain that relationship, we wouldn't have had this great story and this great drama. So it's, there have even been situations I've seen on the news where there's a family where the woman is severely ill from cancer and the man has been loving her, taking care of her, but he's a man after all. And, and like any of us, he needs a companion. So he has found a woman companion and the three of them live together, but not allowable by law. And actually his woman companion whom he loves is helping taking care of his, his wife with cancer. And of course, he, they cannot, he cannot marry her in the society. But they all agreed that if they could only just all be married, if the, both women could be married to the man, it would be a perfect situation. The woman would be accepted as his wife. He would be known as a wonderful man because he was also taking care of his wife that was ill. And his ill wife would have a caretaker. So there are situations where we can begin to understand that Allah's wisdom is for all times and all places. You might even have a situation where a husband and wife are married, but they're disagreeable with one another. They have a contentious relationship but because they have children or they have a business or they have something in common that they love and they enjoy, even though it's difficult for them to live together. Sometimes the addition of another wife can actually give people a breathing space so that when they do see each other, they're happy, they're more contented and so forth. And there's many more reasons which I'm sure we'll get into, but I've always felt that it's a difficult situation, but that if it is handled well and if it's handled honestly and justly, it is something that is meant for some situations, some people, some societies. And that's ours, of course, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah hair. Sister Zainab, we'll we'll move to you. Same question. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I apologize, I do have a bit of a cold. So if I go in and out, please just let me know and I'll go ahead and try my best to speak up. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, similar to what Sister Noor said, and just side note, I am a huge Jane Eyre fan. I mean Jane Austen fan, so anything she does is amazing, <laughs> including Jane Eyre, mashallah. Um, so yeah, I would, I would pretty much agree with everything I mentioned. There are many benefits uh, to polygyny. And first and foremost, uh, when we accept Islam, whether you were born into it or you um, reverted to it later on in life, 
we know that as Muslims, one of our principles in Islam is Samiana wa Adana, right? We hear and we obey. This is a part of our this is a part of the deen of Allah, right? Um, how does that show up <laughs> in real life? Now that's a different story. But um in in and what we what we're supposed to do as Muslims is we're supposed to hear and we obey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated polygyny as something that is a right of the Muslim man. So we have no we have no um opinion thereafter. Now, do we choose to partake in polygyny? That's a that's another topic, right? Do we have to partake in polygyny? No, not necessarily. Can we can we forbid our husbands from partaking in polygyny? In polygyny, that's another conversation too. <laughs> but to say that we are against something that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and His Messenger have come with, that that that's problematic. And similar to what Sister Noor mentioned, um, there are so many benefits in polygyny. And, and the reality is, as we know, uh, women outnumber men, and we will, and the and the gap will continue to increase, right? So there will be women that are left unmarried. Um, the only way that they will have a, an opportunity to marry and complete the other half of their deen is if a brother um, is has the courage and the ability and stability to take on another wife. So that's my position on it. I would like to add also, if you don't mind, sister. It's a lot of it, we take it as something for the men. And I tend to go say the other way that a law prescribes so many things for the benefits of women. And if right. you see also in that verse that uh, we were read, that Nahil was reading, we're talking about taking care of dealing justly and taking care of orphan girls. The, the ayat about marrying more than one woman is always prefaced and then finished about taking care of orphans. So obviously Allah is talking about a need of women, not a need of men. We tend, we tend to think of the men's sexual need. He needs another woman for sex. He needs another woman for children. He needs another woman for whatever his reasons are. But I really believe that Allah is so firm in taking care of women and standing in justice for the rights of women. And as, as you saw in my bio, I'm very big about this, but I'm always bent on Muslim women. We need to know our rights because unfortunately, the um, the ayat get twisted, the hadith get twisted in favor of the men, and this is not right. not the idea at all. I believe that polygamy or polygyny is allowed for the sake of women more so than it, it's both. But we have to concentrate that it's also a boon for women. In the case of war, as you brought up, sister, um, when we have excess of women in the society, and many times, just recently now, women are working. But in many many uh, centuries past, women did not work. So without their husbands, what were they left to do to provide for their many children? Of course, women back then were having more children. What was she to do? And too often she had to turn to very nefarious means to support herself because all she had was her body. She didn't have skills. She had no other means to support herself. So this was a huge ill for the woman, for her children, for the society. So again, Allah is saying, be, uh, you have your wife, but do look to see if there are other women in your society that we can take, that you can take care of and give your name to and give a name to the children and support them as well. So I have always felt that it is much more a benefit for women than if we look at it as being a man, you know, something men want because, oh, I want a younger wife, I want a thinner wife, I want a whatever, I want more children. And some of those are legitimate as well. Some of those are as legitimate as well. But I think we need to take the focus off, it's just for men because that's how we tend to think about it as women and that's how we tend to think about it as non-Muslims. You know, all oh, the men are getting everything. So I think we need to kind of reverse that thinking that Allah did this for us more so than for the man's right, inshallah. Thank you. Um, so you said a couple things, but before I get to those points, Sister Renda, can we get your viewpoint, inshallah? Yes, this was something when I actually uh, came to Islam, uh, again, some of you've been watching, there's been about 26 years, alhamdulillah, since I embraced Islam. And back then that was something I was like, no way and no way and no way. <laughs> so that was something I had a discussion with my husband. And of course, as you grow in your faith and as you grow in your understanding of your faith, um, those thoughts change over time. So because um, you're going to grow in that faith and you're going to understand that everything you do is for the pleasure of Allah and that anything that Allah has set forth for us is for our benefit. And there is a wisdom behind it. And so what's really important is for us to know our faith and to really understand it and know our rights and our obligations so that when we are in this situation, we know um, ourselves what's okay and what's not okay. 
Um, so, you know, my, my viewpoint has changed over time. If that came into my life, it's not necessarily something I would say right now, no, no, no. I think it would be a big challenge for me still, even though um, that would probably be one of my struggles, you know, um, in my faith to be obedient, but also still not letting go of that, that thought process. So that would be a challenge for me if it came into my life, but I would have to really um, pull on my, my faith at that time. Um, but, you know, I found it really interesting that, um, you know, when I, when I learned about this, when I came to Islam, the only other people that I knew that married multiple wives was in a, another faith that's here in the U.S., in the Mormon faith. But I didn't know that um, polygamy is, or polygyny is not exclusive to Islam, which I didn't, I didn't really know a, a lot about it until I became Muslim, to be honest. And um, it's not actually predominant in the Muslim community. It's predominant in uh, more of the Christian, Christian communities, not necessarily in the US per se, but worldwide. And we see that um, the, the, the rate is really actually very high in other parts of the world and other faith ethnic, ethnicities and other uh, religious groups. Um, the Muslims, about 5.7% practice polygyny. 5.7% of the Muslims practice polygyny. And if you look at the Adivasis, this is another kind of religious sect, they're at 15.25%. So that's a high, high difference, you know, and we're, we're looking at the different parts of the world um, in Uganda, Republic of Congo, Central African Republic and Zambia. Uh, you know, they have rates anywhere from 16% to 31.9% that are practicing polygyny. And so this is a common thing that's been throughout the world, throughout history. And when that surah that Sister um, uh, Nahela shared with us, um, Surah Anissa, this came actually to, to regulate the practice of polygyny. This came to, um, you know, solve the problem of women being taken advantage of, in fact. And you'll see that even in common day now, you'll see so many families that are without um, the father in the family that's an active participant in taking care of their wife and children. And so you see that that affects the whole society and each person individually. So it definitely is something that came uh, to ensure fairness and protection for women. And so if we follow what Allah has provided for us, we're going to see that play out in a better way. So my, my, my definition of this has definitely um, morphed and evolved over the years. And I still need to do that. And that comes with more education. So I don't think most women raise their hands and say, um, yes, yes I, I'll do it. You know, I think most of our reaction is no, I could never, I would never. But when faced with it, then I think you have to start, you know, redefining yeah. your priorities and things like that. Yeah, and that's the thing. I don't, I don't say per se it would happen, but if it was to come into play, yeah, then we have to really evaluate because it is something Allah put as it, it doesn't prescribe it, but it makes it okay. So there's a reason. Yeah, going to that, um, Sister Nora, Sister Renda, subhanAllah, I remember the first time I encountered polygamy in terms of even in a conversation, very casual conversation, to understand where I'm at today is I was at a masjid in New Jersey, and there was a sister, subhanAllah, and we're just sitting, having a casual conversation. She looked over, and she said, oh, Nahela, if I had the means, if my family had the means, we would take that sister in. I would take her as my co-wife. She is in need, and I would love to help her because what I want for myself, I want for my sister. And subhanAllah, it kind of opened my eyes. I was like, how self, like, subhanAllah, like we tend to be very selfish um, and we think about ourselves, but that was the first drop for me that it made me understand like subhanAllah, really the hadith is being implemented by wanting really for yourself, you know, you, you're looking out for the other. And so Noor talked about a lot of uh, good points, mashallah. And so we don't think about these things um, I know I was close to um, being married into a polygyny um, uh, relationship, and subhanAllah, I saw so much benefit. It didn't work out, it didn't work out, but 
I, I, I see more benefit uh, when it comes to even companionship, a sisterhood, and what have you. Of course, like Sister Nora mentioned, it has to be done in the right content at the right time. Um, everybody has to be, you know, um, on board. <laughs> on board, exactly. Um, so we have, mashallah, we have a nice audience, and we have one uh, sister that said it's not for me. You know, um, personally would not want uh, poly polygamy for myself, so I would not do that to my sister, subhanAllah. I want for her what I want for myself. So obviously, um, we have to understand that just because it's not for us, right, um, acceptance doesn't always mean that you will do it. Like, we are, like all of you have said, that it, it is instructed by our creator. It doesn't mean that we're going to jump on it and say, okay, this is for me. Um, the next, the next uh, question I want to ask everybody is, you know, um, coming into Islam, we're very vulnerable. We know very little. Um, sometimes we don't understand many things. And so what is uh, one piece of advice uh, offhand uh, that you would give a sister that perhaps was looted. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because I'll tell you a quick story. There was a very young sister, mashallah, she was very new into Islam, but she wanted to get married so bad. And I think we, we see that a lot in our communities, that sometimes we compromise or we don't understand what we want. So whatever is thrown at us, we kind of just take it and grab it. You know, it's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, and so subhanAllah, young girl studying to be a nurse, uh, never been married, beautiful, mashallah, everything, 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 new in Islam. And here comes his brother. And first of all, he was married, had kids, didn't tell her, uh, told her after the fact and after the fact that she was pregnant. And then she was pregnant with twins. Um, and so then send her to a welfare office because he couldn't support her. So these are a lot of layers here, right? And we're talking a lot of, about a lot of things that sisters that are watching. So basically, one of the reasons why, number one, we, we touched on this is because this is the number one topic that we've been kind of getting, right, Arinda? Like, everybody wants us to talk about this. But we really want it to be beneficial, bismillah, and we also want it to be educational. So, uh, sisters, mashallah, you guys are, are well-rounded. Um, what would you say to a situation like this? How can we prevent so here's the thing. We want to prevent these situations from happening, right? We can't always be there, but perhaps somebody can share this video onto a sister that's going through something. So that's where I want to go. Sister Zainab, you want to go first? I would say, yeah, I would actually yeah. say, um, first and foremost, whether you're returning to Islam or you um, reverted to Islam, one of the things you want to, to hold off on is marriage, right? You want to arm yourself with the knowledge of your religion. Yes. And oftentimes those who give us our shahada or help us, you know, embrace Islam, they encourage us to marry <laughs> for many reasons. Um, but I think that that is actually incorrect. And, and here's why. You need to understand your right. You need to understand your right. And not just your rights, but your responsibilities in marriage, whether you choose monogamy or polygamy, right? You need to under have a foundation in that. But in order for you to understand that, you need to have a foundation in your religion. If you don't know your dean and your husband is coming to you in a situation like this, how, where do you go to get your rights? You don't know them, right? So your husband has done a disservice to you, but you've also done a disservice to yourself. So I would say first and foremost, put the brakes on it for just a minute. Learn your religion. Learn your religion. Just because you have a desire does not mean it has to be scratched. You don't have to get married just because you have that desire. There are other means of, 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 of facilitating patients, right, in, in that regard, um, that would be the first, the first thing, if at all possible. And I say this um, for sisters and brothers, find a Muslim mentor that you can trust, right? And sometimes it's a sister um, that trusts a, a brother who is not necessarily interested in marriage, but he's also not her wedding, right? He is just a brother that she can trust and she can bounce ideas off of, hey, there's this brother that's interested in me in, for marriage, you know, and he's coming with, to me with X, Y, and Z. What do you think I should do? Right? Should I go ahead and, and pursue this? Can you help me out? Can you investigate? Can you help me, you know, decide whether or not this is a good idea for me? Become a part of a community. And I think this is easier said than done because so many of our communi communities are fragmented and scattered. So we don't have that infrastructure really set up to support 
um, uh, uh, reverts and those returning to Islam the way that we should, alhamdulillah, for embrace, but we have millions of reverts, right? And unfortunately, we don't have the, the means to support them right now. So they, we will have some that fall through the cracks. But for those that will hear this video and inshallah benefit from it, that would be my advice. Hold off on getting married. Learn your religion. Learn your religion. Give yourself the time to go through the growing pains of the team, right? Because you don't start off all of a sudden um, wearing hijab and, and covering the way Allah has commanded us to the moment you accept Islam. It doesn't work that way. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to gradually grow and, and, and understand why we're doing it. First and foremost, by solidifying our connection to Allah, right? Because everything we do is a manifestation of what we feel in our heart, which is a love and connection for Allah. So that's what I would say to, to my sisters. Um, and also to our brothers too. They're Allah. They're Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave you this right. So with any right that Allah has given us, there's great responsibility. There's great responsibility. And you will be held accountable. And we think, oh, you know, we won't be held accountable. Um, Yom Qiyamah is something far off. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will hold you accountable in this life and the next. Right? It's not just, we're not just waiting for judgment day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you in this life if he so chooses. So I think for our brothers, it's important that they fear Allah too. And don't stumble into marriage, any type of marriage, monogamy, polygyny, haphazardly. Do it with intention. Do it with the intention of being in a lifelong committed relationship. Right? And oftentimes we're getting married to, to fulfill our nafs, but we're not getting married to continue on a legacy of building community. And I think that oftentimes because that's not the intention we have behind getting married, our marriages are failing. So that would be that would be my advice to a sister. Just a little bit. Beautifully said, yeah. Sister Jaina, mashallah. And I agree 100%. So many times the young converts are told, um, you know, get married right away and he will teach you your religion. Do not depend on your husband teaching you anything. <laughs> and unfortunately, like in our country, uh, polygamy, polygyny is illegal. So a man will come and he will say, I'm married legally to this woman here in the United States. We can get married Islamically because being married Islamically, you know, is overall is better and it, it doesn't matter we're married le illegally, legally or not. What's important is the Islamic marriage. And this is the song and dance they will give you. A lot of our imams nowadays will refuse to marry you to a brother without the legal, uh, uh, going through the legal process. So, um, also, if the, you find that there's a sheikh or an imam who's willing to marry you to a guy who just says, we're going to do the Islamic marriage because of X, Y, Z, there's another wife, whatever, I would really stop and consider that. Um, also go to an imam that you trust and ask them. And the trustable imams are the ones who say, this is how you get married. You go down to the uh, registrar's office, you get the certificate of marriage, you apply for that, you bring it to me. When I see you're married legally, then I will marry you Islamically. And actually they are held accountable to the law in this country to do that. And I think actually this is a good thing because I kind of, I've been a Muslim 30 years and I heard a lot of that, you know, Islamic marriage is everything, forget the legal. You know, as long as we're married in the eyes of Allah, that's what counts. And I think, you know, we're also told as Muslims to follow the law of the land. And the law of the land is also there for our protection. So if someone comes to you and they're married and they want you to be the second wife, take those things into consideration. If you want to accept that and only be married Islamically to this man, you are not going to have the rights of the United States of America behind you also should something less than Allah happen to him. So you have to consider your rights. Let's say you're married to the man, but you're going to take your child or you have to fill out an application. He's going to school. You're doing something. You have to file single woman because legally you're not married. So every time you go to pick up a form, you have to lie on the form that you're not married. You're single. But indeed, you are married, right? So it's, those are small things, but it's little things to take into consideration. How will you feel every time you have to write that? And so forth. You know, you, if you feel like you're going into a marriage with questionable things, how will your marriage be? If there's a lie somewhere in that marriage when it starts, how will the marriage evolve? If it starts on a lie, if it starts where he's married, he doesn't tell you and he marries you, your marriage has started on a lie. He was able to lie to you about a very important thing. And also about that other woman, her feelings, her children, and all those other things. So if you've gone into a situation like that, there's already a bad start to your relationship. So that's something to consider too. 
because if he's able to do the lie on that one thing, then there will be other lies too. <laughs> if you're having right. a problem. But the truth of the matter is, and I agree with all of everything you, both of you said, mashallah, um, the truth of the matter is that it's still practice, and we do have good, um, and it's still practice here in the U.S., and so there's ways to actually protect ourselves, right? Even I if we- I say the same uh, thing, Naila, absolutely. Right. So, um, so uh, let's, let's not get into the stigma of all being negative. It's not. As a matter of fact, you know, there's ways to protect yourself. And because it's still being practiced, I personally know several couples that practice uh, polygyny and mashallah, they're very happy, they're content, and their rights are being met. So one way to do that is obviously a will, right? Everybody, uh, you have to make sure that you write a will and you make sure that everybody's taken care of. Um, obviously, like Sister Noor, there's going to be times where perhaps um, health insurance, you can only put one wife, but yet you have to seek for health insurance for that second wife and making sure that you're taking care of her from A to Z. If you're not able to, like the Quran says, it's best one, right? So um, polygamy is not a bad thing. It's, it's really not. It's uh, something that's ordained by, by our creator. And so one of the things that I really want to touch on is w the way we carry ourselves out, the way we speak about this, our children are also listening, right? And if we make it ugly, it becomes ugly. But if we make it educational and our children understand the context about it and how it became about and the ayah, that's a seed, and you teach your children in a beautiful way, it's, it, it, it also helps up their upbringing. Um, and what I mean by that is I have a son, you know, and I always joke around, I want 10 grandbabies, however you do that, you could get four wives. <laughs> and as I joke around, you know, subhanAllah, I only have one son. Um, but he understands that polygamy is by a law, and it's not something ugly. And it's actually, you know, if he were, if his wife were to get sick or what have you, if this is the route. And he always tells me, no, mama, I can only do one, one. I'm like, okay, but that is an option, and that was given to you by a law. So I think that's important to, um, to bring up as far as how we talk about it in the home. What would you guys say about that? I would actually just uh, piggyback off of what you said. I think that it, it, it kind of goes back to the importance of living Islam, right? Um, we're normalizing the practice of Islam within our homes. So I know for me, uh, I, I would say at least half of uh, my close friends are in polygyny, right? And they have co-wives. Some of them have great relationships with their, co with their co-wives. Some of them are just cordial. And this is the choice that they've made, right? But it's normalized. Like my daughter recognizes that my friend's husband has two wives. This is a part of the dean. And they have other siblings from other wives. And in full disclosure, you know, my uh, former husband has multiple wives. My daughter has siblings from polygamous, from her dad's polygynous marriages. And she recognizes that. And we normalize the dean, right? We don't make it something that's so strange. What's strange to my daughter is celebrating Christmas. That's, that's abnormal to her. But the dean, things, matters of the dean, and she's only six. The matters of the dean, I normalize them because in order for her to internalize Islam, we have to live it. We have to normalize it. So I think for me, that was something that was really important. And I think, Nahila, the point that you made about teaching your son, listen, you don't have to partake in polygamy. You don't have to practice it. But you have that right to do so. It is something that is from our dean. And everything by default, as Sister Arinda mentioned, from our dean is for our benefit. And this is where our belief in Allah comes in. We, every, everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated for us, even if it's challenging, it's for the benefit of us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us more than we love our own children. And when I think about my daughter and the love that I feel for her, I get chills because to just think about someone hurting her, I go crazy. <laughs> so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me more than that, subhanAllah, everything he does for us is out of his love. And I teach my daughter that for herself and for and to give her a strong Islamic foundation. So I think that that's really important, normalizing the deen. Sister Renda, you have four kids. Has, is this topic, um, you know? Yeah, it definitely comes up. My oldest is a boy and he's 21. So, um, you know, Alhamdulillah, he's very interested in learning about the deen um, at his age and he has always been. But um, yeah, it is definitely something that comes up because it, 
it seems to be a controversial subject no matter where you're at. If you're in a non-Muslim community or a Islamic community, it can be uh, both ways. You don't hear it very often as a very positive thing. And so it is something we have to go back to our faith. We have to go back to the teaching that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. And while in uh, Anissa where it says, but if you fear that you cannot treat them justly um, and you will not be able to deal with them justly, then only one or that which your right hand possesses that would be more suitable to prevent you from misservice. So there is a very big responsibility on the men's shoulders, right? It does give permissibility. Islam really um, encourages monogamy. This is something that's a big part of, of our faith, that it permits polygyny with those exceptions. And when we find the situations where we see negative things happening, it's typically, and, and I'll give an example. Um, years ago, I met a sister and I'd never met anyone in a polygynous relationship um, until um, I lived in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. And I went to a new masjid and I met a sister and she was a niqabi and she asked me for a ride home. So we ended up driving back and forth for Friday prayers uh, every week. And so I was just fascinated. I was like, oh my goodness, you're, you're the first wife of two. I'm so curious, do you mind if I ask you questions? Because if I don't ask questions, how I'm gonna know, right? And she was very open and um, she was very happy with the arrangement but as time went on, you do see challenges in the relationship, but it's, it's going back to Islam to fix those challenges. And it's with any marriage, even if you're married to one person, you have problems all the time. You have confrontation, you have conflicts, you have things you have to resolve all the time. And if you're not resolving them, it's going to be a problem, no matter if it's one person or four, right? So, um, you know, that was really refreshing to see her take on it, see that the, there was issues that they would come upon, but they were going back to Islam to resolve those issues in the relationship. And when you see those problems coming in, it's typically because people aren't following what Allah has ordained for us. And if we go to Surah At-Taha, um, this is chapter 30, verse 41. Allah says, corruption has spread on land and sea as a result of what people's hands have done, so that God may cause them to taste the consequences of some of their deeds, and perhaps they might return to the right path. So when we see a lot of these negative things happening, it doesn't mean polygyny is negative in itself. It means the people aren't following what's been set forth. And that's why they're seeing those issues. So it's so important. We always stress, know your faith. Know your faith. That's the key. The Nord, society has a lot of um, effect on us. And as we said at the beginning, polygamy has, polygyny has always existed and it still exists in some parts of the world. It does not exist in the Western part of the world and it's even been made illegal, right? So we are affected as Muslims by this. We are affected against this negative idea of polygyny. Like, you know, it's not acceptable in the Western world. But however, we look at, um, legal uh, polygamy, which is all this adultery that's going on all the time. When I was growing up, there were even some laws in the books that you could not, it, 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 adultery was illegal if someone knew about it in, a, in society, in a state, so forth. Now it's very common. Men go out and sleep with all kinds of women, even though they're married and vice versa. And a lot of times when American audiences will ask me about this, I'll say, well, ladies, let me ask you something. And nobody raised their hand, but how many have you been in a relationship with? Either you've been the mistress or you were the married woman and there was a mistress in the family. The problem with that is the wife has his name. She has the children by him. She is known in the community as his wife. The mistress, of course, is hidden away. If she has children, they cannot take his name. He can only support her minimally and it's gotta be kept a secret. If the man decides he has to choose one or the other, one of those women is going to lose. Either the wife is going to be divorced and he goes with the mistress, or he's going to have to say to the mistress, I got to be with my wife, that's it. So a woman always loses. In a situation in Islam where there is one man and two women, both women will win eventually. Both women have to be taken care of financially by the man. He has a lot of responsibility in marrying two or more. They must be both taken care of financially. So that means a man going into a second marriage already knows, has to know he has the financial wherewithal to take care of two wives, two households, two sets of kids, and so forth, and everything else that goes along with that. So there's a lot of onus on the man to make this right. And uh, so in Islam, when there is 
the idea of two. And, and we have to take into account the fitter of men and women. Women are very loyal creatures. We tend to be very happy with one man. That's good enough. Whereas men, if you ask them, if you ask them honestly, if you ask your husband or your father or your son, they might tell you, yes, we could be happy. We could find love in our hearts for more than one. And that's a fact of how differently Allah has made us. And especially in today's society, we are throwing out all the fitra, especially as it concerns men and women, with women saying, you know, even in we've given up our haya because now we can dress and act and do everything we want and behave in any way we want. And men just need to get over it and take care of themselves. And that's very much ignoring the fitra of men, right? We, we have women in every sort of, uh, you know, seductive pose and clothing and everything else. And they will wear it and say, I can do whatever I want and be anything I want to be and dress any way I want to be. And you, Roy, need to get over it and with, you know, hold yourself. So I have a lot of issues with that as well, too. So, um, you know, we are up against a lot with the, the loosening of morals and the loosening of these ethics in the United States and elsewhere in, in the West, which is difficult for us as Muslims. I mean, we have to remember that jihad, this struggle and striving is almost a pillar of Islam, that we constantly have to strive and struggle because we do have the truth in Islam. And what Allah tells us, like this huge idea of polygamy that is at, for all of the world at all times, all places, not a mandate, but a possible choice and option when we need it, that Allah's vision is so much greater than anything that's man-made. But we have to struggle a little bit as Muslims to kind of, we aren't going to go with the status quo of the West and the mandates of the West and the loosening of the morals and the ideas because there's kind of all kinds of marriage but there's all kinds of relationships outside of marriage and it's all allowed nowadays islam says we need the modesty and these regulations for a reason so that the world continues in a good and ethical and moral way and we're losing a lot of that so i really encourage our our converts and reverts here it's just hang on to your deen and hang on to what is right that you read and stick with your quran and know your quran know your religion and know your rights, ladies. It lies out there to take care of you. <laughs> You're number one. Mashallah. You touched on uh, my next point, so I won't even go there. Mashallah. You you made this so much easier. Allah. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Noor. <laughs> I have too much to say, as you know, Nahila. Nahila. Oh, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I think it's it's a very, been very fruitful, mashallah, and very smooth, which is really what we always intend for. Um, there's never a controversial and there's never debate because uh, topics such as this should not be debatable. It's very clear uh, what Allah has ordained. And so, subhanAllah, believe it or not, we're coming to an end uh, of the hour. So this went by really, really quick. Uh, but I do want us to, all of us, and um, to basically uh, give some advice, some tangible advice. I know we've said that learn your dean, um, perhaps uh, some red flags or something that we need to look out that is really tangible that sisters and perhaps even brothers need to really understand uh, about polygyny, right? When it comes to um, all of you have mentioned there's going to be signs and there's going to be what are those signs? So perhaps we can uh, something that that people will hear and say, oh, OK, if I hear, uh, OK, don't tell anyone we're getting married. We know that's wrong. Point blank. No, it's not acceptable. You have to make that marriage, um, you know, you have to uh, make public. Right. No. So we know that's part of. Uh, the protocol of marriage. So when someone tells you, you know, we're going to get married, but don't tell anyone, that's that's my number one red flag. Uh, excuse me, you're not following Islam. Nope. So let's start um, with you, Sister Zainab. What is that one thing or, or what can we end on, on a positive note, inshallah, so these sisters will not make these continuously mistakes or we can actually help, inshallah. So, right, I think you touched on, on, on a few. First and foremost, um, arming yourself with uh, knowledge of your religion. Uh, that would be the, the first thing that you do and, and kind of setting a foundation um, of knowledge and continuing to grow and evolve in your religion. Um, the other thing that I would do, and this would be advice for both brothers and sisters, be intentional. Um, we don't stumble into monogamy um, haphazardly, and we should not stumble, absolutely <laughs> not stumble into polygyny haphazardly. We should be very intentional about what we're doing. Obviously, um, if we do choose um, to be in a polygynous marriage, there will be challenges that we would not face in monogamy. And to say that the challenges are the same is, is not being honest, right? But 
but it doesn't mean, as um, Sister Nor mentioned, that these, these challenges are insurmountable. You can't over, overcome them. You absolutely can. Just because something is a little uncomfortable does not mean that it is not good for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, you may hate a thing, but this thing may be good for you. And you may love a thing, but this thing may not be good for you. It may be evil for you. So I think the same is to be said about polygyny for women. Because as uh, Sister Noor mentioned, our fitra is to, we're okay with one man. Alhamdulillah, like that's good enough for me. <laughs> like our fitra, if we're connected to our intrinsic femininity, which is what I call it for women, if we're connected to our fitra, because many women are not, then we're comfortable with, with more than one man. But unfortunately, as she mentioned, many women are not connected to their intrinsic femininity, which is why you see a, a uptick in zina and all types of other crazy uh, sins that are not the norm for women, right? Um, but understanding that the best of women, the Sahabiyat and Muhatta Mu'mineen, they had challenges with their jealousy and polygyny. They uh, had disagreements. They had um, wives that they were closer to, other wives that they were just cordial with. So there is no... There is no right or wrong way to be in a relationship with a co-wife. But what is important is to understand that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated for us and it is a beautiful uh, thing. And when practiced properly, it, 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 it can really be the beginning of the building of our community, the rebuilding of our communities. Our communities are struggling and marriage is on the decline within the Muslim community, especially the indigenous Muslim community. Marriage is really on the decline. Um, I had three friends this year alone that let me know that they were recently divorced that have been married for 20 plus years. So our marriages are, are really struggling. So be intentional about it. Brothers, be, be mindful of this being not just your right, but a responsibility. And anything that you have a responsibility for, you will be questioned about. Take this seriously. If you believe in Allah in the last day, understand that you will be questioned about everything that you do. So that would be my advice, inshallah. One thing I would say to the brothers, and I mentioned this before we got started today, that if you are intending to take a second wife, but you dearly love your first wife and you want to maintain your lovely relationship with her, be very careful how you take this next step. It makes a lot of difference in how the men handle this whole idea. And that's if you want to preserve, I assume if you're keeping your first wife and you don't divorce her, that you still love her and you still want to keep the relationship going. So if that's the case, you want to be very careful how you handle things. There has to be a lot of, you're my first wife. You were there when I first started. You helped me build the family, my life, my work, and my everything. And oftentimes it's, the, of course, the first wife who's put in all the work who is going to start to think like, oh, okay, and now he's going to take someone else after I've worked so hard now that he's set and he has a house and beautiful things, you know, now someone's going to walk in and have it easy. So that's something to think about. And again, as the sister Zainab said, it's, it's with rights come responsibilities as well. But one thing I've heard, I have a lot of friends who have been through some rather disastrous kinds of uh, polygyny <laughs> where men have hidden the truth from them for years and they've had children with other women and so forth. And then the woman finds out that's a very difficult thing. But to help them through that, I've often said, well, we know that all the souls of people were created along with Adam. So all the little babies in the world were also created when Adam was created. And sometimes what helps you get through those relationships and your husband has another wife with other children is those children were also created along with your children. So this was something that was going to happen. This is part of your test. And Allah tells us throughout the Quran Life is all about tests and trials. And he gives us this beautiful book, how to navigate the tests and trials that he's going to throw our way or the tests and trials that we ourselves create in life. So if we remember that, or we tend to think that this marriage was something that was going to come down the path for me regardless. It's, it's a way to look forward and also to look for what is the baraka in this extra relationship that Allah has added to my life. And I think in all terms of anything in the Quran, even hijab, we tend to look for all the verses like why I shouldn't have to wear it, why I shouldn't have to get married with another, a man with another wife. We always look at the negative side. What about if we look for what are the reasons that Allah asks us to accept this? What are the reasons Allah asks us to wear hijab? What are the reasons Allah asks us to accept polygyny in some cases? And I think if we look for it that way, then Allah will reveal there's baraka in that choice as well. And again, I'm really urging the brothers, do this very carefully. For the sisters out there, a lot of men who are born Muslims will come to us as converts and want to marry us. 
And just remember a lot of things. Marriage is very difficult. Marrying someone of your own culture. You have married into a new religion, a new culture, new in-laws. He has a different way about him. He's going to be expecting the way of his family and not the way of this American girl he's married. So there are going to be some, a lot of expectations on his part. You're going to be expecting him to teach you everything beautiful about the Dean. And some of these things just don't happen. So be, be careful again, as Sister Zainab uh, reiterated so beautifully, be careful in your choices. Take marriage very seriously. Marriage is difficult enough among an American and American from the same background. Now we're a new Muslim marrying to someone who's culturally a Muslim. He's from another country. He has a different set of culture, different set of values. His values, Islamic values, maybe all cultural values. So there's a lot to take into consideration. There's a lot of beauty in that too when you adapt a new culture and a new lifestyle and his foods and his family's way and all those other things. But there's a lot to, to take into consideration. So when you go into marriage, be careful. Don't rush into it because all your friends are like, now we got to get you married, which is what I heard a lot when I was a new Muslim. And they want to marry you off to the first guy who comes along. It's a big, big step. And in Islam, it's a bigger step than ever. So do take those into consideration. Be careful, be mindful. And you know, always ask Allah to guide you to the best in this life and in the hereafter, inshallah. Now, you know, if I could just add one thing, there's an organization called Outstanding Personal Relationship. It's a polygynous couple, um, and they actually support uh, Muslims, um, or non-Muslims too, uh, because they do practice polygyny as well, that are interested in practicing polygyny. And it's the brother and his two wives, and they have an amazing relationship, and they are a community resource. And, and I really encourage Muslims to look into this organization, Outstanding Personal Relationship. It's with a brother named Nazir and his two wives, Sister Fatima and Sister Naila, actually. Um, <laughs> and um, alhamdulillah, they do a lot of amazing work around supporting uh, Muslim couples from transitioning from monogamy to polygyny. So I really encourage anyone that's watching, that's interested to go ahead and look them up, inshallah. We will, normally Arenda puts those links, so she'll yeah. add that link. Okay, hey. great. Afterwards, yeah. but added. Sister Renda, any last thoughts? Um, yeah, we... so going off what the sisters both said, absolutely great advice for everyone. And um, to keep in mind, um, make sure you're getting your sources. If you're if you are in a position of this maybe coming into your life or you're a part of it already and need more information, go to the proper sources. And I think I've said this almost on every episode we have. Go to a source that's knowledgeable and has had the training and education in this. Don't go to the chat groups and ask your friends because you might just be going in there to get the answer you want. And sometimes you'll get some really bad horror stories um, that will completely turn you off and mislead you and won't be something that will be accurate at all. And we always have to fall back on our faith, right? So when we are listening to all of what we're talking about today, um, Allah tells us in Surah At-Taha, uh, verse 123, you go to the world, my guidance will come. And if you follow guidance, no misfortune or misleading will ensue. No fear, no suffering or tribulation. So when we follow Allah's commandments and we do our best, our intention is to do the best to follow that. We're not perfect, but our intention is to follow that. Then Allah promises we're not going to go through those trials and tribulations course we can't control what other people do that's why it's so important to know your own rights and your obligations as well in any relationship whether you're in a monogamous relationship or a polygamy relationship and so um, I noticed one of our just really quick one of our viewers brothers actually made a very good point when we're talking about um, having multiple wives says that sounds easy what we're giving advice being positive and everything sounds easy, but is it reality? Does each wife get equal time and equal money? And is that it? Where do emotions come in? And this is a very important point. And I listened to a really great um, lecture yesterday on this. Um, we're all talking about the, the ability to financially support multiple wives, right? We, we, we didn't even touch on the emotional end. So that is a very important portion as well, which probably we'll have another episode on this at another time. But very good question to bring um, bring up and from one of the brothers, no less, which is amazing. So thank you for bringing that up. And we will keep that in our files for our Q&A session at one point when we get one of our shakes on here to answer that from a very um, educated point of view. Thank you guys for tuning in.
So Jazakala here, everyone. We want to encourage everyone to join us this evening. We have Hadith Rush, and we have a very, very busy weekend. Uh, tomorrow, we have the Friday Reminder, and we also have a movie uh, documentary watch in the evening. On Saturday, we have Dr. Ray from New Jersey, mashallah, who's going to be joining our Pass the Mic, and we will be talking about mental health, another important topic. Uh, and then we have in the morning on Saturdays, the Sisters Halakha, and so a lot of programming. Make sure that you check our social media. Um, and remember, we are here as a resource, and if we don't have the answers, we will always try to uh, seek for those answers for you. We do have a, a scholar, Sheikh Jazzy McKinsey, um, that can always help as well. So with that, we're going to close. Jazakallah here, everyone. Please, if you found tonight, today's um you know, chat uh, beneficial, and you know of anyone struggling or anyone seeking uh, for this um, polygyny, make sure that you share this um, this video, inshallah. I think it, it was very fruitful. Ladies, Jazakallah Khair again for accepting this invitation. I know we, it took us a few weeks, but we finally made it, alhamdulillah, and we pray the law, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from us. Jazakallah khair, everyone. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.